and we are live. So today we are going to be talking about the tattoo industry back then and today. So in today's episode, we're going to interact with you and you guys are going to be sharing your experience. I'm sure this live broadcast is going to be full with people from all types of ages. And that's the beauty about this industry, that it's basically an industry for everyone. No matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been in the business, no matter uh, how much you have been tattooing, this is an industry for those that have passion for it and those that, you know, ultimately want to push the R forward. So, guys, how's everyone doing today? I see that a lot of people are joining us right now. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late today. I'm not wearing my hat. And, yeah, uh, I kind of feel weird not looking at myself with a hat on this live broadcast. Anyway, I have this little curl right there. Um, so... I would like to start by saying that things have changed a lot, you know, from when I started tattooing until now, things are completely different. And not only uh, the style of tattoos, you know, how tattoo styles have evolved, but also the equipment, the people, you know. If you look back years ago, you're going to look at a tattoo artist that does not look anything uh, like the new guys that are coming out, you know. And one thing that shocks me a little bit is that there are so many tattoo artists that I've seen recently. They don't have tattoos, but they are amazing. They are amazing tattoo artists. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, you know, n something that I've never seen before. But at the same time, I, I you know, I, I don't blame them because... Honestly, um, there are a lot of tattoos that I want to remove. And yes, you know, a lot of my tattoos, you know, tell the story. But when I look at the amount of art and, you know, the, the quality of the art that you see these days out there, it makes me want to wear them all. So uh, I'm actually contemplating removing some of the, uh, you know, my earlier tattoos. You know, I got stuff right here that makes no sense. You know, I, got, I started getting tattoos early 80s. Yeah, 1985, I think I got my first tattoo. So completely young, I was probably... Man, I was freaking young. I was 15 years old when I got my first tattoo. 15 years old. Not only I got my first tattoo, I also gave my first tattoo at the age of, age of uh, 15 years old. There was something that I had here. Um, yeah, whatever. This has to go. You know, this has to go. But I'm sure that a lot of you guys, uh, you know, have tattoos that tell this story too, right? But I'm due for a new tattoo. So guys, let me see. What do we have here? I always forget how to turn the comments on here. So there you go. So guys, so today I want to talk about, yes, um, I want to start talking about my beginning and then I'm going to ask you guys questions. So feel free to interact here in the comments below, you know, uh, tell me, you know, tell me how you started tattooing, but I, uh, how you started tattooing, what do you think about the industry? So I want to say that when I first started tattooing, as some of you may know already, you know, I was born in Argentina. My dad is Sicilian. My mother's Argentinian. Uh, very conservative family. And, you know, back then, uh, over there in my city in Rosario, there weren't tattoo shops. The tattoo shops were illegal. Um, there weren't a lot of people, like, even considering tattooing. There were a couple of guys in the entire city at that time, like, 3 million people living in that city. So, you know, when you only have two guys uh, that are somewhat tattooed in, in tattoo, Obviously, they tattoo at their home, and tattoo is illegal, and you cannot buy supplies. So, um, those times were completely were completely different because whoever wanted to approach tattooing, I mentioned this in my uh, prior live broadcast. Whoever wanted to approach tattooing was actually someone that really wanted to be a tattoo artist. And um, you know, there was no internet, there was there was no Facebook, no Instagram, there weren't uh, uh, TV shows, you know, promoting tattoos. Nobody wanted to talk about tattoos, basically, you know. Your parents did not want you to be a tattoo artist, so it was kind of rough back then, you know. Um, I got my first tattoo, like I mentioned before, in Brazil, actually. It was in Camboriú, the city of Camboriú. I got my first tattoo, I remember, by this lady that used to work at a square in Camboriú, and I remember until this day, oh my God, it was so reckless. This lady was wiping me with a cloth full of ink, and I now, you know, I am 41 years old, I now remember back then, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so lucky that I didn't get any uh, any disease or anything, but back then, things were pretty rough, man, and you know, there, there was not a lot of, uh, you know, people used to have to wear no gloves even earlier. So, um, 
that's how I got my first tattoo, and right away I got hooked. It was a little spider over here, so I already covered it up. But that's how I got, you know, started with tattooing. Again, uh, to find a great tattoo artist was almost um, almost impossible. I mean, and there was not a lot of difference between a great tattoo artist and a guy that is so-so. It was kind of like in between, you know, it was almost, almost the same. It's not like right now where you have this artist doing that. You know, amazing traditional work, amazing neo traditional, amazing black and gray, amazing realism color. You know, back then the that that you know that contracts didn't exist. You know, most of the tattoos that you know I've I've remember from back then were uh, traditional Japanese and traditional tattoos and your regular mom hard and you know simple tattoos names and stuff like that. Black and gray wasn't a thing. You know that earlier. Yeah, there were some guys trying. Uh, a couple of things, but you know nothing like this. This was considered black and gray back then. You know this one, I got it so many, so many years ago. It's kind of mimicking black and gray, but you see, it's a lot of white. This is curly from the Three Stooges. So um, there, you know, tattoos were so so basic back then. You know, and but again, it was beautiful because I remember going to uh, my first tattoo conventions. I think uh, where. Was the first tattoo convention i think i went to a tattoo convention in brazil it was and it was a completely different experience you know it wasn't like today that you go and you see family people with their kids you know you see a bunch of vendors it was more of a club you know going at a tattoo convention was this underground thing that you would do and you know you will get in if you found out about someone that told you that there was a show shows were shows were very very small um, and it was full of, you know, it was full of like characters. I remember this war because I was with Lyle Tottle like a couple of months ago at FK Irons headquarters. He was there and we were talking about the subject. By the way, that video with Lyle Tottle is right here on YouTube if you want to watch it. He talks about the industry. But yeah, I remember Lyle Tottle said back then, uh, tattooers, you know, were characters and the industry had a lot of character. And it's true, you know, you used to go to this, uh, these conventions and, and yes, indeed, people did have characters, you know, uh, the one that had tattoos and was tattooing, he was born to be a tattoo artist, you know what I'm saying? And um, you could see it, you know, they were all about a tattoo, you know, and, and how, you know, how, you know, the, the, the psychology about getting tattooed, you know, back then you never got tattooed from your hand up, you know, back then you started you know, like I did, you know, you started from this and then you work your way down, right? Where a lot of people are saying that right now, you know, people start their first tattoo, boom, neck tattoo or I or were tattoo. That's their first first tattoo. So things, you know, things have changed this day. So uh, let me read some of the comments that you guys are already typing. So Aaron Raymond said, we never wore gloves in the 80s and and use rate light face cloth instead of paper towel. Yeah. Uh, Barry Lefter, Leffler say biker style when I got my first one. Exactly, biker style. That was it. Uh, and Raymond say I got my first tattoo, Grim Reaper, in 1881. I was 16 years old. There you go, man. David Palacios, I was 8 years old when I saw someone that had a full color sleeve uh, for the first time. Ever since then, I knew I was going to be doing this. Yeah, man. Uh, myself, how I how did I get uh, started tattooing? Well, it was right after I got. It actually was a coincidence because I traveled to Brazil with my aunt and my cousin, and uh, I actually my cousin and I we were in an excursion in a bus, right? So my cousin and I we uh, were let go around you know the bus stop. People were doing their you know touristic things, and me and my cousin was started walking, and you know we started seeing people. We started seeing. Uh, you know, this road ahead with a lot of fun. So we started like going. All of a sudden we walked away um, out of my aunt's side. And all of a sudden I find this tattoo shop. Tattoos right here. Cambrio, Brazil. So um, I go to this tattoo shop and, you know, I just see people getting tattooed. I'm like, I have to get tattooed. This is so awesome. Flash on the wall. So that's how I got my first tattoo. And then I came back and very short after... I'm watching TV before going to bed. I'm never going to remember. It was kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm never going to forget. I'm sorry. I'm never going to forget. It was one of those uh, uh, type of uh, documentary, kind of like lockup, but from back then in Argentina in Spanish. And it was about how tattoos were illegal in prison, how tattoo artists were building tattoo machines out of uh, anything they could find uh, around themselves. So I remember that there was uh, an episode 
there they were showing how a tattoo artist with a pen with a big pen and um and a guitar string he made a hand poke and i'm like that is so cool that means that if i have a sharp object and i attach it somewhere i can tattoo very irresponsible and i wish i knew better but i was 15 years old and i had a lot of determination and i wanted to do that i wanted to tattoo right so my dad at that time uh he used to uh, breed german shepherds and that was his hobby and uh, he had a lot of uh, needles for vaccinations for the dog. And also, he was studying architecture. So I'm like, I have the India ink with me, you know, the little black Indian ink thing. Remember those? And then I have the needle. So I figure, you know, this guy's making tattoos with a needle, uh, with a guitar string. So the needles are hollow and they're way sharper. What about if I use this to make a tattoo? And I actually gave myself my first tattoo hand poke on me. It's actually somewhere in there. It's a little house with a cloud, and um, I, w I wanted to draw it, actually. Anyway, I don't have anything to draw right now, but um, that was my first tattoo. Then my best friend in high school is like, oh my God, you have a tattoo? I want a tattoo. So I do a tattoo on him right here, right next to the hip. My second tattoo was in high school. Yes, I gave my first tattoo uh, second uh, year in high school uh, to my friend, in the bathroom yeah so my second tattoo was in school inside a bathroom can you believe that Whoa. man I think about the things that I did and then I gave my uh, tattoo to my uh, to my cousin and that's how you know how I started tattooing and then I started I started exploring you know ways to actually automate the process because you know uh, one needle per customer per customer you know I never charged for a tattoo back then and um, and that's how I started tattooing. You know, that's how I got interested in, in tattoos. Uh, that's how I started. You know, I'm not embarrassed. Uh, I, you know, I wish I did it better. I can tell you that definitely. I don't recommend anyone starting this way because, uh, you know, obviously I could have got myself sick. I could have got someone sick, but, you know, what's done, it's done. So that's how I started getting tattoo. And then I started refining the tattoo machine and exploring how to make better tattoo machines. And now here I am talking about tattoos with you and telling you about the story uh, from back then. So that's a little bit of history, how I got started in the industry. Now, um, you know, getting tattoo over there was kind of like a taboo. You know, you would get a tattoo and then you better hide. You know, you better hide because if you wanted to go to school or you wanted to uh, get a job, you know, and people saw that you had tattoos, you were in trouble, bro. And in Argentina, you know, uh, things, you know, back then used to arrive years later. So if anything was cool in the United States over there, you know, it takes 10 years to get there. Now it's, you know, we're actually equal balance. But back then, because of the lack of, you know, the communication media and Internet and all that stuff, which I think in some way is good that the Internet didn't exist because people that wanted to do things, they did it because they felt it. It's not because they were influenced by uh, TV shows are not influenced by other people doing the same thing. So uh, that was it. So I'm going to continue reading some of the messages, guys. Let's see. Love hearing about the times before then. This is Cisco Delgato. Uh, he started in 2000. Uh, Eric Couture said, Tattoo mainly inspired me in prison. That when I knew this is for me. There you go. Sorry for you being locked up, man. But you know what's done is done. I've been tattooing for 20 years in Brazil. Cheer. Yeah, Marcelo. Um, I actually got my first tattoo in Camboriú. Maybe you know the name of the lady. What's the lady tattoo artist in Camboriú uh, that tattooed in front of a square? Um, Prestige Body Art said, I built my first tattoo machine from an 8-track player. Yes, a lot of us, you know, build tattoo machines with motors. That was the easiest way to build a tattoo machine. Um... <laughs> yeah, what else? Uh, Drunk Monk 22 got my first tattoo when I was 18 at a low key spot by an old school Harley dude. It was about <laughs> he was about four coronas. I before he started my tat and killed two more during. <laughs> Man, I gotta tell you about my first tattoo. I wish it was Corona. Uh, Skolo uh, sketches and I'm an apprentice right now and this is great conversation. I'm still only 23 and I love hearing about the history. Yeah, man. It doesn't matter how old you are. What it matters is that you're here for the right reasons. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. What matter is that you're doing this because you feel it. Because I see a lot of people just jumping right in and uh, getting fully tattoos. You know, apprentices that are covered and they're like in their early 20s. They already cover. Uh, nothing wrong with being covered, but um, 
make sure that this is for you, you know, because once tattoos are on you, then you're stuck with them for the rest of your life unless you want to endure, like, painful laser uh, sessions. Like, I'm going to have to be facing, I've been putting that away on the side. So yeah, uh, then when I got my first color tattoo, this one right here, which is, is a koi fish. Let me see. It's a koi fish and a naked lady. You see that hesitation point right there? Well, I hope my mom doesn't understand what I'm about to say, but that guy blew a line of coke. I remember, I was 17 back then. Well, he was tattooing me. I was like, what the hell is this guy doing? So he stopped. He combed a line on the table and he went. <laughs> and then he kept on tattooing me. And I guess he was a little bit stiff and boom, he poked me there. Uh, really, really nice. So, uh, wow. Anyway, um, those were the good days. I mean, good days. Would I say they were the good days? Those were, you know, that was back then, actually, because I really enjoyed uh, the industry today. I really enjoy the history. I really enjoy people talking about, you know, how things were back then. But, uh, you know, I think we have an amazing tattoo industry these days. Yes, it may have its ups and down. Uh, now we have way too many conventions where back then we, you know, to go to a convention was like, like you have to be part of a secret society almost. And... Uh, there were little ones, but those were awesome because most conventions, uh, they were thrown by tattoo artists that were known in the, kind of like in the uh, circuit of tattooers. And, you know, even though they were small, they were busy, they were good, you know. Uh, Prestige uh, Body Art says, come such a long way since then. And I remember when we didn't, when we didn't even worry necessarily about wearing gloves. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I did not miss not wearing gloves, let me tell you. Uh, thank God gloves are here. Um, yeah, so things were a lot different. Then I came to the United States in 1997. Things were completely different over here, way over accelerated. I remember conventions here in the United States. They used to be a lot nicer too. Um, we're talking about what, 20 years ago? 20 years ago, tattoo shows were awesome, man. It, they were full of artists. They were full of people. Everyone was tattooing. Uh, everyone was into this because of the right reasons. Um, it was just different. Yeah, it was more of a biker type of scene, but I mean, I enjoy the biker, you know, click as well, you know. And I like, you know, I like that part of history in tattoo conventions. So uh, right now we have a lot of shows, you know, guys. So let's face it, we have a lot of shows. We have great shows and we have okay shows and we have horrible shows. You know, that's the the truth of the matter. Let's not uh, mask it. But um Everything is so much more accessible right now. I remember when I first wanted to get my first Spalding Roger machine and my first national that I had to go through hell. It took me about a year to find a magazine uh, from the United States. Um, I think the magazine was Tattoo or Tattoo Art. I don't remember. And I remember in the back of the magazine, there was uh, a Spalding Roger uh, ad with the ordering address so to order a tattoo machine you have to write to them and then they would have to reply to you via letter and you would have to make all these arrange arrangements uh via you know via um mail or over the phone and i used to live in argentina i didn't speak any english so it was very complicated so finally after i don't remember how i got my first paulding roger and national honestly i don't remember if it was through the magazine or through a friend or someone that traveled to the united states I just remember that I got uh, my, my national tattoo machine and my Spalding Roger. I don't even know the name. I, I don't even have those machines. I wish I had those machines. But uh, what I do remember is that I went through hell to get one machine, uh, one Spalding Roger and one national. And I wanted to have more tattoo machines. So what I was doing is back then, I wasn't even soldering my needles. I was actually grabbing the needle bar that I was making myself with wire. I would put uh, my liners, I would configure my liners, and then I would wrap a thread, like sewing thread, and put super glue. That's how a lot of artists over there uh, started making modern needles, you know. And there were a couple of friends. And then, you know, uh, then we discovered that we can solder needles, and that was a game changer. So then we started soldering needles and all that stuff. And then when I came to the United States, I'm like, oh, my God, people here don't have to solder needles. You can just buy them and pop it in the machine. That to me was like, what? 
I want to tattoo even more now. So um, I'm not going to lie. I never enjoyed making needles. And there are some people that do enjoy making needles, but I never enjoy making needles because it used to take me so long to make a couple of needles and then having to redo it again for the next tattoo. So sometimes I used to um, make the needles. Let's say I will make uh, uh, two shaders, you know, I always had like a, like a seven magnum and uh, a seven mag and my needles were single stack, nothing fancy, single stack magnum and my liners, right? <clears throat> and then if I would have another customer, I would have to undo the needle bar because I didn't have many needle bars. So I would reuse the needle bar, uh, burn it with fire and do all over again. So my client would sit over there waiting for me to build a needle. I would build a needle. I would put out, I would soak him in alcohol. I remember we used to leave him overnight in, uh, in bleach. And then the next day we will burn it and rebuild it. You know, we were tossing the needle, that for sure. So um, ink ups. Ooh, my first ink ups. Remember, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with blister pack aspirin, right? The blister pack aspirin or the chiclets thing. Well, that's what I used to use for uh, ink ups. So I would buy gum or aspirin just to use that as an ink up back then in Argentina, right? And I, or I would use like little cups for, you know, rinse cups and stuff like that. So I would waste a lot of ink. <sighs> Getting ink was another problem. I don't think I ever tattooed with great inks until I came to the United States. You know, all the inks... Um, all the inks that I always used were ink that someone made through someone. I never knew the source of the ink that I was tattooing with. A lot of uh, uh, drawing ink, you know, uh, which actually, well, that was the great ink, but the color uh, drawing ink was terrible. You know, you would put that on the skin and next day it will be gone. So yeah, whew, guys, the ones that are in this industry right now, man, you guys have it so easy, so, so easy. And you guys shouldn't take that for granted because before, man, you have to go through hell to actually even start getting prepped up for tattooing. At least for me. Let me see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Barry Leffler say I, he used to use plastic spoon. <laughs> Prestige Body R say Rockstar Status 20 years ago. Man, I, I really liked this time. It was just fun. So much fun. Everything felt so much more realistic, you know. You will go to a shop and it's like you are walking into this new dimension, you know, completely unknown. And like everything else, you know, the world open and you were encapsulated in this new world. And all of a sudden you're enjoying every single aspect, like taking a look at the flash, talking to the artist, the smell of green soap or whatever product we were using back there. Uh, in my country, a bleach. So you would go to a, a house where someone was tattooing, it would smell like bleach because everything had to be cleaned, you know. Anyway, and right now, man, wow, we, we almost, what do we do? Just peel off a cartridge, you know, peel it off and pop it in the grip. So we have came a long way. And I think that, you know, the evolution of technology, you know, now we have the cartridge grip, uh, we have... Uh, you know, rotary machines, we have coil machines that are really reliable, we have disposable grips, you know, and all this technology is what allows us to to become a better tattoo artist, because before you have to worry a lot about your setup, you know, first of all, you have to worry about your needles, how are you going to tattoo this person if you don't have needles, so you have to figure out how to make needles, so then that would take you months to learn how to make needles, you know, decently, then you would have to figure it out how to keep, you know, how to keep the supplies in because I used to run out and of needles and I used to use sewing needles, you know, the needles to sew. I used to use those needles because that's what I was able to find, you know, so sewing needles then sometimes you will run out and you have to like steal needles from your mother uh, to build more needles and stuff like that. And man, it, it's, uh, let me see. I think it's, uh, let me see, I'm gonna read this, this comment. Uh, Drunk Monk 22, he used to use gum packs. <laughs> um, then uh, what else? Uh, Prestige Buyer said, it's funny. I think it's funny how I went from using rotary machines that were, that we made to coil manufacturing machines and now top of the line machine are reverted back to rotaries. Yeah, man. Uh, what else? Full circle. So, um, you know, now the technology had allowed artists to become better tattoo artists. And I think that even though, you know, some of us are, are kind of like, man, I wish, you know, I, I was able to become a good tattoo artist this fast. Because these guys, 
the amount of artwork that these tattoo artists are putting these days, you know, is completely incredible. You know, I never even thought about tattoos being so realistic, so, you know, so rich. Right now we have tattoo artists that are equally as detailed as a, as a painting, you know, as an oil painting. The things that people are putting out out there is mind-blowing. And some of these guys, you know, some of them, they haven't even been in the game for more than two years, you know. Uh, myself, to become a good tattoo artist, I mean, it took me a long time. I think I probably missed around the first five years of my career. Remind, you know, remind you, I started tattooing at 15. So it wasn't until I came to the United States that I was kind of like, okay, uh, producing tattoos. And, and, uh, and again, it was a struggle for me even here because, you know, I didn't know where to get equipment. Back then, the internet didn't exist. Uh, but, you know, you could go to a shop and maybe, you know, establish a relationship with the shop owner and, you know, get some supplies. So that's how I got, that's how I got started. You know, I made friends and friends, you know, and had friends and, you know, they, that's how I got started uh, tattooing again here in the United States. But it took me a while to actually get back in the game because uh, when I came here, I didn't have a dime. So I came with $300 in my pocket and that was all I had under my name. I knew I wasn't coming, uh, coming back to my country. And, uh, well, here I am, guys, uh, making tattoo machines uh, for for the tattoo industry. So I would like to know how some of you guys uh, have started. What do you guys thought about the industry back then? Uh, just feel free to enter the comments here below. Uh, Drummond said, LOL, now, I was saying about how you use them. I was fortunate enough to use ink caps when I started. Uh, you started in 2009. Yeah, Drummond, 2009, you are a baby, brother. Uh, and I wish, you know, I wish I had the amount of uh, resources that we have right now. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm actually glad. I mean, I, I'm really glad that I went through all this because going through that struggle is actually what it pushed me to create the, these products that you know that we make right now because i was always trying to perfect the tools that i used you know when i used to make my first needles you know remember like with a thread and you know i discovered that you can solder needles and then when i discovered that you can buy needles i'm like man this is that's it you know i want a tattoo 24 7. and um indeed um Having gone through that struggle of getting the equipment is what really got me interested in equipment making, you know. Uh, sometimes you have to go through something to appreciate something, right? And I think that's the case for me uh, with, uh, with tattoo equipment. So, in the other hand, let's talk a little bit about... Let's talk about, a little bit about those guys that are not appreciating tattoo in this day. You know, those guys that have everything... Uh, available and they're still complaining that you know they cannot get an apprenticeship uh, they still complain that they cannot this and that and that I remember you know back then people you use if you were a tattoo artist you were like kind of like an alien right you were kind of like an, this alien and you were unique and people look at you differently so that was you that was your lifestyle you know so you would wake up breathe eat and crap tattoos and that's what you would do all day long and some of the guys back then, including myself, we weren't the best tattoo artists out there, you know. We were just guys putting drawings on people's skin. And, um, but that didn't matter because we really, really liked what we, what we did. Our customer appreciated the tattoo, the quality of the work that we were giving them. They were solid pieces, you know, they would stay on the skin. But um, we, would, we would always, you know, try to do better, try to get better, talk with other artists, you know, kind of like uh, uh, share techniques and stuff like that, you know. One of the things I remember from back then is that there, there were just a couple secret sauce, right? So what I mean by this is like, if you wanted to do clean lines, you have to use this machine configured this way, this liner, because a liner is for lines. If you wanted to do color, you have to use a color packer, and this machine is a color packer because because of this spring and this setup and that. If you wanted to do soft shader, you have to have your soft shader. And it's funny how everything had reverted it right now, right? Because right now, this machine does everything. It's set up to do whatever you want, you know? So before we were relying way too much on the way the machine was set up. And I remember machines sounding like hell back then and people like pulling good work. And probably if I would have a chance to to get those machines back in my hands, those machines probably would be out of whack, you know, but 
because someone told the artist that that was a color packer, the guy would not dare to try anything else but that machine for color packing. So, uh, Prestige Body Art say, I still have my original Spal uh, Spalding Roger keychain with a gap with the gap gauges. I remember that the coin, uh, uh, the diamond, the uh, nickel. Carry every day. Uh, yeah. And Remy said, I started in 1988 and I used to use syringe end caps from my friend Diabetic Mother Supply. Wow, man, that's great. Uh, of course, I remember Joe Kaplan. Uh, Joe Kaplan is was my very first aluminum machine. I did not know that anyone could make tattoo machines out of aluminum. That was actually my inspiration to do the aluminum line, which it was the AL13 line, which right now I still have one right here. This is the new one, this is the exactor, but um, it's a very light tattoo machine made out of aluminum, uh, an exactor available at fkirons.com in case you're interested. And um, I really, I had a Joe Kaplan, I don't remember the model, but I remember that when I looked at the frame, the frame had, had bubbles, air bubbles. So apparently he would melt aluminum from whatever he could find aluminum and craft his frames. And they were very loud. I remember those machines were so loud, but they were great. That was the first aluminum machine that I tattooed with and I fell in love. Um, and then, you know, I'm like, man, would it be possible to make uh, an aluminum machine better? And for years, you know, I, I struggle figuring it out. I just didn't know that you could make things out of uh, uh, aluminum, you know, welding. I mean, I didn't know how to weld back then. Uh, I did not have the resources to even machine or afford machinists. So I kind of put that on, on hold until, you know, I was able to, to actually make my own uh, first aluminum machine, which was in 2007 when I introduced the very first aluminum machine, which was the, uh, the FK Irons Galaxy. That was my very first design, followed by the Exactor, and followed by the Pyro and the Zen. Those were my first designs. So if you guys want, I can tell you how I got into the machine making and how everything transpired. Okay, what else? There you go. So, um, Scully Sketches is like, what's your opinion on Ink Master? That's a good topic, man. What is my opinion on Ink Master? Well, I can tell you that I've been at Ink Master twice at the finale as a, as a guest, uh, ex spectator. And um, I think the shows are good, man. I mean, people are going to say that, oh, yeah, they were rigged up or this and that and that. But, you know, TV show is meant to be en entertaining and educational and whatever, you know, whatever you want the TV to be. So... Um, I think they serve a purpose. You know, we all may agree and disagree. A lot of the guys that went to the to Ink Master are friends, personal friends of mine, and I know where they come from, and I know who they are, and I hang out with them. And a lot of them, they're great, great, great tattoo artists. And the fact that sometimes compete and they lose, well, you know, that goes to show you that uh, you don't have to be uh, a known name these days to to be someone with talent. Now. What do I think about the way the you know the judge and all that stuff? You know, I don't want to get into that because that's that's kind of personal. You know, I really respect you know the guys that throw the show, all the repeg, uh, uh, Dave Navarro and uh, uh, Chris Nunez. You know, you know, I, I really I really like what they're doing. I really like that they are putting tattoos on TV. You know, because back then, you know, your mother wouldn't let you watch uh, a TV show if there was someone with tattoo. The fact that now is so widely open tattoos. Uh, you, you know, it kind of makes me happy that it's not that, that, that stigma that used to be back in the days. And, and again, you know, we all may have different opinions about the subject, but in the end, I think that tattoos, uh, they may be mainstream, but now they're well accepted. And that's what had allowed the art to grow, to grow as art, you know, uh, to grow as, as quality, you know, because you look at the work that people are putting together today and um, it's mind-blowing really mind-blowing so what else guys we have about 20 minutes of the show uh, left welcome back G what's up man how you doing uh, okay G Raj I just got back into tattooing that's great man um, a lot of people put pauses I have put a pause in in tattooing you know I kind of like rediscover uh, tattooing because back then like I said I went through so much struggle every time I wanted to do a tattoo was kind of like uh, was a mission it was a mission the supplies the ink why do I put the ink I, I don't have needles I need to get needles 
And when I came to the United States, I have to work, you know, I have to do what I had to do. And no, I didn't cross the border. I came with a visa and password for those who want to ask. And I do support, uh, I do support control of, of, of the borders and securing, you know, our frontiers. You know, you want to be here? Come here legally. Anyway, so what else? Uh, uh, mm -mm. All right, some people are talking, they're having their own conversations. So, um, so that's it, man. Uh, and I'm so glad that I got to meet uh, Lyle Tato. Um, I actually have a tattoo on my leg by Lyle Tato, his signature. He did it like a couple of years back ago. And um, yeah, man, uh, every time I talk to him, uh, so many so many stories. Uh, there is a video again, if you're just tuning in. I said it before, there is a video. Um, there is a video on YouTube, so if you want to watch it, it's really nice and really long. It's about an hour or two. Um, I agree with you, Gaston. It's completely amazing what some of the artists today are doing. I would have never thought some of the things I see today were even possible 20 or 30 years ago. It's completely, completely true. Lie calls me Nati Native American. <laughs> Is the moving of the company going to affect uh, ordering products? Okay, Blue de Zilua. Actually, no, man. The moving of the company is actually because we are expanding to better serve our customers, you know. Uh, yeah, it has been pretty hectic. You know, we have been working around the clock, you know, even Saturdays and late at night, uh, just trying to keep up. And in order to hire more people, we need bigger spaces. You know, they need to be able to move. We need offices we need more uh, customer service so that's where the movie is going to happen it's going to happen this uh, Friday I'm probably going to be broadcasting from there with my drone I am going to be doing a live broadcast with my drone yes I'm going to be flying my drone and actually I'm going to be showing the warehouse and as uh, things happen so I think that's going to be pretty cool uh, but no it shouldn't affect I mean we have everything under control we um, right now we have four well five warehouses we have right now one is the CNC warehouse um, the other one is the, the, the headquarters with, uh, where assembly is at and, and shipping. Then we have a warehouse that we bought, that we bought a year and a half ago, but now we're going to sell because we actually, it was 10,000 square feet and we're, we're going to turn it into like a two story, uh, a warehouse. It was going to be 18,000 square feet. It was going to cost a lot of, a, a lot of money. So, because we also outgrew that square footage, we need something bigger. We're moving to 18,000 square feet right now. So that one is for sale, and we have these two warehouses that we just leased, uh, where we are going to move the CNC shop into uh, one warehouse, it's moving to 6,000 square feet, and then uh, FK Irons Headquarters uh, Assembly and Dark Lab Tattoo Supply are moving to the 12,000 square feet warehouse, one next to the other. So uh, everything is going to be much more efficient right now. Uh, we are doubling our staff, so uh, pretty soon we're going to be like, I think, 40-something, uh, or 50 maybe. And um, yeah, man, we're doing this because you guys have given us a chance to, uh, you know, to get here. You know, you guys have basically dictated what we make, you know, and we really appreciate it. Let me see. Let me write, uh, read some of the comments. Uh, Scully Sketches said, I think there was always a lot of really amazing artists out there, but the emergence of social media is giving more artists a platform. Completely agree with you, man. Uh, Ryan uh, Townsend say, how did FK Iron Star? How did FK Iron Star? Okay, I believe I said that in a video before, but I'm going to sum it up. You know, I'm going to try to condense it very, 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 very much. So when I first came to the United States, you know, I did not have a job and I was taking all kinds of jobs. I was doing, uh, uh, I was uh, waiting tables. I was doing, uh, I was a, a burger flipper. That was my first job. And then I got a, I was cleaning windows. I would wash cars. And then I got my job at a Speedo selling uh, bathing suits. So I had to work, you know, I couldn't pick and choose. So I was doing a lot of things, you know, back then. And then, you know, one day someone asked me for a tattoo machine. And I remember that back then I used to do tattoo machines. So I'm like, let me put a tattoo machine together. So I actually went to Home Depot and started like scouting for a bunch of random materials, bought tool and everything. I'm like, oh, let me put a tattoo machine together in my garage. And I put a tattoo machine together with a welder. I've never welded before. So I learned how to weld. And, um, you know, I started chopping with a hot saw. I remember, you know, crafting this the whole frame by hand and just welding. That's how I started in my garage. And then, you know, 
I started posting my machines on social media back then for the forum. I remember the first forum that I was that I came across with was the Guy Atchison forum and Nick Baxter. So I was posting my machines there and you know uh, people were taking notice and people were asking me for a machine so I would I would craft machine for other fellow uh, forum members and then Nick Baxter asked me for a machine. So Nick Baxter asked me for a machine. I actually um, made him a machine, but that was when I was looking for ways to automate the process. You know, to make a machine would take me three days or two days and stuff like that. And sometimes I remember I used to break tabs right right about when I was about to finish the coil machine. When I would tap the spring bay, boom, I would break the tap and then I would have to start all over again. And that was completely tedious i'm like okay how can i bring precision tattoo machines in hands to tattoo artists you know these machines are still rough you know they're handmade but how can i bring precision and how can i bring uh rapidity consistent quality to my customers so i started looking for shops that would craft things out of uh, steel and i landed with a shop i used to make uh motorcycle parts and I told them the ideas that I have about making a line of machine that was the Galaxy Pirate Zen and Exactor. So I would draft the machine in 2D with all the dimensions, you know, I would uh, guesstimate the dimensions based on machines that I own and, th and the machines that I was making uh, by hand. And um, that's how I started. I made 50 machines of each and those machines flew overnight. Nick Baxter got a machine and then Nick Baxter told all the friends and then all of a sudden I'm you know, basically sponsoring this machine because at first I just want to give them for free. You know, for those people, I felt very rewarded that my idols, my tattoo idols, were using my machines. So I would give machines to these guys, and that's when I started the FK Iron Pro Team. You know, we got highly criticized for the word pro team, but uh, there was no pro team back then. You know, I guess we also came up with that. and. You know, so I started sponsoring those guys, and we would do tattoo conventions together with the F. Karen Pro Team, which was Sean Z, um, Lucas Natalini, Nick Baxter, who well, Jeff Mansolf, I remember. Uh, a lot of guys. Um, uh, Adrian Dominic later on, Jeff Asminger, and, you know, uh, Nick Hurtado. So, all of a sudden, you know, I start, I start, um, you know, I start working with this artist we start working together they will tell me uh, tips about the machine i would improve them and that's why i called them the pro team because i consider them pros you know and uh they actually helped us to get to where we are and because of that you know our brand uh and the tenacity uh and my focus you know on making better tattoo machines and you know learning that i've gone through hell back in the days you know getting equipment i just wanted to put good stuff on hands of tattoo artists that's basically how we started guys and from my garage, we moved to my apartment because I had to unfortunately sell my house. And then I moved to an apartment, which was smaller than my garage. So then I moved the manufacturer inside a tiny bedroom in one apartment. And I had I would have machines, grinders in one apartment on the fifth floor, I remember. So that's how we got started, man. And from that day, uh, grinding, grinding, grinding every day, nonstop. Let's read some of the comments. All right. Um... Pretty excited to hear who the two artists are going to be for the giveaway of this time. I'm pretty excited too, man. Tang Sion, Sion say, hey, nice to meet you. I just ordered my first FK Irons edge. I'm excited to get it. Just started my tattooing career for one year. Now hoping to get as good as you. Man, uh, it's all about it's all about trying, it's all about perfecting, it's all about sleeping, eating, and crapping tattoo, you know. Uh just you have to live for the craft, I think, you know, if you want to become really, really good. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty, you know, we're pretty diligent with our orders, you know. Uh, like I said, sometimes, you know, we may run out of stock, you know, we let our customers know. We're ramping up our customer service to having more people get in touch with you guys. One thing for sure, no social media. Please do not communicate on social media. The person that handles social media is our graphic designer. He does not check the messages, so... If you have an inquiry, uh, send it to service at fkirons.com or orders at fkirons.com. <laughs> uh, Cisco, that got to say life before proteins. Yeah, man, life before protein was was awesome. Uh, thank you for your machine and uh, machine building passion. No problem, man. I'm actually really thankful that you guys love the things that we've been putting out. Putting out. 
So David Palacios has an idea. David Palacios, you can contact me also at service at fcounter.com and have them route the email, please, if you don't mind. So yeah, that's how you know we get started. And like I said, again, we go back to back in the days. We go back to now. There are not excuses for you not to become a really good tattoo artist if you really uh, want to be a good tattoo artist. You know, if your intentions are honest, you know, you can become a really good tattoo artist if you're willing to give it all. Uh, it's just a lot easier to get started than it was before. You know, um, there are so many tattoo shops right now, so I think not to get an apprenticeship is kind of, apprenticeship is kind of like a, it's kind of like an excuse to say. You know, if you don't get an apprenticeship, you're not looking that good because there are so many tattoo shops out there everywhere if you don't find a shop around your house well move man if you really want to become a tattoo artist do what it takes uh one thing for sure is i do not encourage people to uh take matters in, in into their own hands you know even though that's how i started you know uh, there, there were a lot of crappy tattoos and people do not destroy crappy tattoos you know uh i tattoo myself i tattoo my, my tattoo my cousin my family you know friends since high school they donated their skin but it's not fair for them you know for us, this day, with the amount of technology that we have available to be putting out substandard tattoos on people, you know, uh, I think that the the bar has been risen, and uh, we got to live up to, you know, the quality of work that people are putting out right now. Okay, so how about old school? Uh, how, what about old school? Old school is awesome. Uh, Drake Montoya, hey man, I'd like to know if you already answered this already, but I'm thinking about getting my first pen soon. What is the difference between the Cyan and the Cheyenne? Okay, guys, I'm going to talk about our pen. Uh, I don't like to talk about other people's product, but our pen has give adjustment. Uh, you can change the stroke. It's going to come with two strokes. that uh, They're going to be, I believe, 3.2 and, and, uh, and 3.8. Uh, you have ratcheting system, so you know when you adjust the, uh, the throw, it, it just locks in place. It has mortable system. It's uh, ergonomic profile. You are going to have a disposable head. So there are a lot of things that are going to make this pen uh, another. I consider great release from FK Irons because it basically packs all the features of all the products that we have created, even including the RPG uh, click. You know the the click ergo, the click click click. So the profile of the grip is similar. And um, so if you've been digging, oops, if you've been digging our, you know, our equipment that I have right here, let me just tilt the camera a little bit. There you go. Uh, you won't be disappointed with, uh, with the release of the pen. But again, to each its own, you know, uh, I, I'm sure that the pen is not going to be for everyone, that there are going to be people that are going to hate it probably. But that's the nature of equipment. That's the nature of everything that entails that entails, um, you know, taste. I like this. Uh, this uh, Read this out. Uh, knowledge is power. Passion is priceless. I completely agree with that. I saw the Scion give yesterday. Showing it, showing it on hard grip doesn't show how stuff it can go. I found my Edge X spring too hard and swapped it out for a softer spring. Are you going to make a softer spring? All right, Hellraiser. So um, I explained a couple of videos ago the reason the reason why uh, the spring has to be a little bit uh, stiff, in my opinion. Uh, and it's because when you have a very softer spring, the machine becomes a little bit noisier, especially at high voltages. And as you increase the voltage, a uh, harder spring will turn uh, soft because you have the tension of this cartridge counteracting the tension of this spring, the give spring, and therefore creating that momentum where, <clears throat> where they both become soft. And uh, that's what we have done. I mean, that's what people have been digging and we continue to do. And so the sign has a little bit more travel than the, the EJX, but uh, um, again, you know, I would say uh, give, yes, it's good to have it. A little bit of give helps, but a lot of give, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of cushion, a lot of spring, and it sometimes result in t uh, tattoos being overworked. Because bottom line is that if you have a soft spring, very soft spring, you're not getting penetration. I don't care how hard your machine is hitting, you're not gonna get penetration. You know, if the spring is soft, especially if you tattoo with cartridges, you're not going to get penetration. And at first, you're gonna see that your tattoo is. Awesomely saturated, but when that tattoo heals off, your tattoos are gonna fade because you're not gonna be poking particles deep enough for the tattoo to remain solid over time after healing. So this is the reason why we have opted for that uh, a stiffer spring because the the effect of the give is not what people think a give is. Give is not uh, equal 
to soft shades. Give is not equal to smooth blends. What it is, is that give is what would assist you to achieve that technique of the softness. In the end, it's all about in the hand of the artist and um, not rely so much on the machine to do the work for us because that's what sometimes frustrates some artists and some people, you know, they think that uh, the machine we give all of a sudden they're black and gray is gonna be completely smooth. And, and you know, it had happened that we have talked to a lot of customers and, um, you know, sometimes people are not happy with the results. And sometimes you look at their work and you're like, okay, well, there are some things that you probably should try before you uh, criticize the machine, perhaps your technique. So that's why I encourage people to work with what they have, you know, and get familiar with the hand. In the end, a really good tattoo artist is going to be able to basically uh, put a nice tattoo regardless uh, the type of machine you use you know i have again a lot of tattoos in the industry now at 41 i have done over 300 conventions i believe so a lot of conventions made a lot of people and i continue meeting a lot of people i mean i love this industry guy it's about to be uh, 11 o'clock an hour of our live broadcast so i'm going to read a couple of the comments and um so we ended up talking about tattoos right uh it was about the industry so I hope you guys have shared, you know, this little history about at least my career. And thank you to all of you for have shared uh, your experiences. I'm sorry I couldn't read all the messages, but I always do my best to actually try to keep up. So, guys, um, thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you're interested in any of this product right here, you know where to get it, fkirons.com. Also, you can check there uh, for any distributor worldwide in the distributor link. So, just... Give it a click and see who's right nearby you where you can get these things right here. Be careful with counterfeit, guys. Uh, we got a machine sent in the other day that was a counterfeit. We spotted it. And I'm sorry. We got to tell that uh, customer off. And that's exactly what we did. We don't appreciate that, you know. So um, always support originality, guys. Support the companies that support you. And I'll see you guys in another episode of FKR right here in YouTube. Take care. Good night, everyone.